Lovely, right. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I hope, thank you, thank you all for coming, by the way. I hope you're doing all right wherever you are around the world. This has been a great opportunity to um, put on my CV that I've given an international lecture, so that's nice. Um, so yeah, as, uh, as advertised, my uh, talk is on negative mass. And um, it's quite an interesting thing to um, talk about because obviously in the universe, there's a lot of um, duality involved in most things. So like charges can be positive or negative, um, magnetic poles are north or south, spins are up or down. But um, that's not uh, really the way with mass. Everything has either a positive mass or a mass of zero. I found it personally a bit weird to when I learned that light itself actually has no mass at all. I found that a bit strange. But um, it turns out if you do sort of uh, suspend disbelief a little bit and uh, just kind of think about like theoretically what would happen if you put a negative mass into some situation, it turns out that there's some pretty funky stuff that it does and uh, certainly some very counterintuitive things as well. Um, okay, so what, what do we mean when we're talking about negative mass? Um, so this is an equation that uh, some of you might have seen if you've done some like very advanced uh, physics work in the past. Um, and the, so the idea is if, it, if it, you've got a negative mass uh, as a represented by a purple block here, obviously if you put a force on it and M is negative, then it will accelerate in the opposite direction. So if you push on it, then it will accelerate into your hand and if you attach a piece of string to it and pull on the string it'll accelerate away from you pretty weird already so um if we think about kind of the main way that mass uh you know impacts the universe gravity so this is um newton's law which you'll have obviously all seen uh, i've highlighted m1 m2 because that's going to be an important uh, factor to consider so this is the situation that you're all obviously very aware of. Uh, two positive masses. Uh, the product M1, M2, which I'm going to stress, is positive. And uh, that means that if you're careful with all the vectors and the directions, that means that the forces are going to be acting inwards. And because they're positive masses, they accelerate in the same direction. So they will accelerate towards each other. They will gravitationally attract. No surprises there. If we have two negative masses, well, the, the product M1, M2 is still positive. We've got a minus times a minus. So that means that the forces are going to be in, actually in the same direction as for the two positive masses. But because we're now dealing with negative masses, they're going to accelerate in the opposite direction to the forces on them. So they're going to accelerate away from each other. And uh, so they're going to gravitationally repel. So what if we have um, one positive, one negative? Well, importantly, this time M1, M2 is uh, obviously negative. And so that means that the forces are now going to be acting outwards. They're going to be in the opposite direction to before. As for uh, the accelerations, the positive mass is obviously going to be accelerating in the same direction. The negative mass is going to be accelerating in the opposite direction to its force, which is the same direction as the positive mass. So in other words, if we have uh, like plus a kilo and minus a kilo and we put them uh, just at rest somewhere, then they will just accelerate together and accelerate together and accelerate together up to an arbitrarily close speed to the speed of light. Pretty weird. And um, at this point, any you know, self-respecting physicist obviously has loads and loads of alarm bells going off in their head because, well, we've got two things not moving and then we've got two things going at the speed of light, nearly. Surely energy isn't conserved in this weird situation. Well, let's have a closer look. So if we've got like a symmetrical situation here, so um, the, they have, the masses have the same magnitude, which is a weird phrase. Um, then um, well, that's going to well start them off at rest. Start them off at rest. So um, there's initially no kinetic energy, and uh, because it's a symmetrical situation, they're both going to have the same speed at any given time. So they're both going to reach a speed uh, of v. Both going to be going in the same direction, of course. Um, and because this is a symmetrical situation, they have the same magnitude of mass. 
they're not actually going to separate from each other. They're just going to follow each other off forever. And so uh, that means that the distance between them isn't actually going to change. And uh, because the distance between them isn't going to change, the potential energy, the gravitational potential energy of this system uh, is also not going to change because that only depends on the distance between them, of course. And uh, interestingly, in this case, the uh, gravitational potential energy uh, of each mass is actually positive, which, uh, which it, ne it never normally is. So we know that the, the potential energy, whatever it is, it's not going to change. But is the kinetic energy going to change? Well, if they're um, at a later time, the positive mass is obviously going to have a half mv squared. And the negative mass going at the same speed is going to have a half minus mv squared. And so the kinetic energies are actually going to cancel out. The uh, kinetic energy, therefore, of the whole thing doesn't actually change. Neither does the potential energy, as I've said. And so energy is actually conserved here. Even though it really, really doesn't look like it, and this is an absolutely you know, stupid situation, we've got two things starting at rest and then going nearly at the speed of light. And it's because the positive one gains a really, really high kinetic energy, and the negative one gains a really, really high negative kinetic energy uh, of equal magnitude, and so they, they cancel each other out perfectly. Uh, and different physicists might have had different alarm bells going off. You might have thought, well, we've got two things not moving, then two things going over there. Surely momentum isn't conserved, but um, I think you might be able to see from this that we've got mv towards the left and then minus mv towards the left, which I guess is mv towards the right, whatever. Uh, it cancels out and momentum is actually conserved as well. So this is another... Uh, situation I just couldn't resist including because it's really, really cool. So this is somebody, something that uh, someone thought of in the 90s. So the thing we've got here is, uh, so we're in the Earth's gravitational field here. So there's a constant, you know, a constant gravitational field. We're close to the Earth's surface. And uh, we've got uh, a negative mass connected by a string uh, to a positive mass directly below it. And um, I'm going to say that these are uh, small masses, and so they're, you know, they're not going to interfere with each other gravitationally. Uh, but they are going to have a gravitational force on them due to the Earth, and uh, the positive on the positive mass that will obviously be downwards. Uh, for the negative mass, that will that will be upwards. And given they're connected by a string, uh, they have uh, equal tension forces on them as well. So if we set this up so that we have, again, an equal sort of magnitude of mass, say we have like minus a kilo and plus a kilo. And if the forces on the positive mass are balanced, then it's the same forces on the negative mass. They're just like in the in the opposite direction. So if the positive mass is in equilibrium, then so is the negative mass. So in other words, if we are able to set up this situation, this whole thing will just float there in the air. Kind of weird. But it gets weirder because if we then cut the rope, the tension forces obviously disappear. And what happens now is obviously the positive mass, there's no force holding it upwards anymore. The positive mass will fall to the fall to the ground, excuse me. The negative mass, on the other hand, only now has a force upwards but it's a negative mass, so it will also accelerate to the ground. So to sum up, negative mass connected by a string to a positive mass, the whole thing just floats there. Cut the string and both masses fall to the floor. How crazy is that, right? And uh, you, can, you can kind of think about putting it in negative masses into all sorts of situations and you get really, really weird, cool stuff going on. Even something as boring as everybody's favorite mechanical system, the harmonic oscillator, that's got, um, it's got an interesting twist to it when you put uh, in a negative mass. So um, I know you know this, but for a positive mass, which is, uh, which is in yellow here, uh, this is what Newton's law looks like. I know you know this, but um, that's the differential equation you get. And uh, the solutions are sines and cosines. You get oscillatory motion. If we then replace the positive mass with a negative mass in purple, 
then you get some quite different things going on. This is the differential equation you get up, you end up with, and the solutions to this are now exponential. So if you displace the negative mass slightly from equilibrium, it will end up accelerating off in one direction forever and exponentially so. And we can kind of think about why that might be, because if you have a negative mass and you uh, displace it from equilibrium, there's going to be a force going backwards to equilibrium, obviously. But because it's a negative mass, it will respond to that force back to equilibrium by going away from equilibrium, accelerating away. That only makes the uh, restoring force larger, though, and so it will accelerate off to the right even, even more, and you get this positive feedback loop and it exponentially runs away. And, and incidentally, you can also show that um, there's no uh, violation of conservation of energy here either, because um, as this negative mass is exponentially zooming off in that direction, its kinetic energy obviously increases exponentially, but it's actually negative. So it will go like minus e to the something squared. But that is um, obviously cancelled out by the um, large amount of uh, positive potential energy that's going to this spring as you're stretching it to all hell and probably breaking it very, very quickly. And again, you can show that they do actually cancel out perfectly and um, there is no, um, there's no violation of conservation of energy here. It's kind of weird, but there doesn't seem to be any laws of physics which say that you can't have a negative mass. It's even though they produce really weird results that nobody in their right mind would ever think would happen. There doesn't seem to be anything wrong with them, in a sense. But, you know, I would encourage you to think whenever you've got like some kind of physical situation you're analyzing, what would happen if you put a negative mass in it? Because I've only known a few, but they've all been really fun and really weird outcomes. So, you know, it's probably worth it. Speaking of really fun and really weird, let's get quantum physics involved. So um, here we have a, uh, a one dimensional square well. This is another um, first year thing, so I won't dwell on it too long. Uh, but we have a one dimensional uh, finite square well here. And uh, I'm going to be considering the cases where the energy is less than the, than the barrier, so less than four in these on this graph. And uh, the solutions to this. Uh, looks something looks something like this. Um, most of you have seen something like this before, but you've got uh, the oscillatory behavior in the middle where the particle is obviously quite happy uh, to be. And these exponential decays as you go you know, into the wall as the particle tries to tunnel out. Right. So that's for a positive mass. If you have a negative mass, then the only thing that changes is the um, is the sign at the front disappears. But the solutions to um, this equation are a bit more, well, they're different. Uh, you can see that now we've got exponential decays in, in the box. This is actually a, a cosh and a, a, cosh and a shine. Uh, by the way, ignore, the, ignore the, um, like the baseline energy levels. Those are just random. But, um, but anyway, you've got, some, you've got exponential decays in the actual box. And you can also see that. Within the walls, we've got oscillatory behavior again. So the particle doesn't like being within the box. It likes being in the walls. And this would have sort of consequences if you had like some kind of negative mass liquid in a beaker, right? That liquid would seep into the walls of the beaker it wouldn't go out the other side because it doesn't like being you know, outside. It doesn't, it doesn't, if it doesn't like being within the beaker, it wouldn't like being outside the beaker. It just sort of goes into the walls and stays there, right? So that's the kind of thing we're dealing with and uh, probably quite dangerous to have in the lab, particularly as if you touched it, then it would accelerate into your hand and into your body and God knows what it would do biologically. So um, that's what happens if you try and put it in a box. What if you put it in a harmonic oscillator? So um, again, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but um, I'm a first year, so this is technically above my pay grade, but um, I've done my best. So uh, with a harmonic oscillator, you've obviously got a, a 
a parabolic potential. Uh, here we are, half, the potential here is a half k x squared. Uh, you'll often see this written as a, a half m omega squared x squared, but um, I've tried to avoid using omegas because omega actually depends on m, and I want to keep all of the m's like out in the open and really obvious. So um, the solutions to this are um, a bit complicated, but uh, quite well characterized. Uh, these things at the um, at the at the front, these HN functions, uh, these are known as the Hermite polynomials. They uh, are, you know, just like a series of polynomials. The first one is one. The second one's two x. Next one's like four x squared minus two, I think. So that's that's just um, a sequence of polynomials here, a family of polynomials, and then they're being multiplied by this Gaussian here. And um, the variable that this is in, by the way, um, this is actually the, the fourth root of this quantity, uh, km over h bar squared uh, x. And you can see that this is actually uh, the same variable here, but squared, obviously. Um, so this fourth root turns into just a square root. Uh, that's going to turn out to be quite important. Uh, but anyway, they look like this. Uh, the, the ground state there is literally just a Gaussian. And uh, the first excited state is uh, x times a Gaussian. Um, but you've got, you've got a similar situation in the sense that uh, you've got sort of oscillatory behavior going on in the uh, classically allowed region. But then when you go where classical physics would not let you go, you get exponential decays because the particle doesn't like being there. So if we have a negative mass, then the um, the equation changes by just the minus sign disappears at the front, obviously. Uh, but in terms of the wave functions, what they do is we've got a minus sign coming here. As we substitute in m for minus m, oh, well, vice versa. But uh, you get the minus signs here and here. And if we try to uh, bring those out of the root, then what we'll get uh, in this bit is we'll get the fourth root of minus 1 or well, the square root of i, or e to the i pi over 4, take your pick. Um, so the variable is essentially changes. So we know that these aren't going to be real wave functions anymore. For the positive mass, these are just um, you know, completely real. But um, as we've got some polynomials in some, uh, some now complex variables, it's going to be a complex wave function. It's also quite interesting what happens in the exponential term. Because now we've got a minus sign just under the square bracket rather than a, a fourth root. So if this comes out, then we're going to get i. So this is now e to the i something. So this is just going to be sines and cosines here. And in fact, it's multiplied by x squared. So the frequency of the oscillations is going to get quadratically quicker. Uh, but enough, enough talk. Let's see some pictures. And this is what they look like. So as I said, these are, these are no longer real. Obviously, these are now complex. And so they have uh, real and imaginary parts. But there's a kind of, uh, there's, well, there's a few things going on here. Firstly, in the ground state, it's really, really flat near the middle. I, don't, I haven't really looked into that very much, but that's kind of funky. Um, and secondly, you've got, you've got these kind of exponential decays going on-ish. Uh, in, in the region we, where we would expect to find them, where there was oscillatory behavior for the uh, positive mass ones. And um, there's something going on at the edge here, but it's kind of clipped off by this graph. So if we zoom out a little bit, yeah, we can definitely see that there's uh, some oscillations going on where we would expect certainly a classical positive mass particle not to be. So um, this is you know more evidence that the particle just likes being where other things do not like being. There are, there are issues with these wave functions, though, and I'm not sure that they are totally legal, um, because if we think about the uh, probability function of this, so we're obviously taking the, uh, the modulus of the wave function squared, then because this, uh, this exponential term is now e to the i something, the magnitude of that is just 1. So the magnitude of this entire term is just one. Um, but for, as for the uh, Hermite polynomial, the, um, 
magnitude is just whatever the magnitude of the Elmite polynomial is, squared. Um, not squared, never mind. Um, but anyway, so for the uh, ground state wave function, the, um, the magnitude actually would stay constant throughout. So in other words, you would be equally likely to find your particle near the middle as on Jupiter. And um, for, the, for the first excited states, the uh, sort of amplitude of the wave function grows linearly because this, um, this function is actually 2x. Um, so this, the amplitude grows linearly. And uh, so the probability actually grows, grows quadratically. So you would be enormously, enormously more likely to find your particle on Jupiter than you would in the oscillator that you started it in. So I think there's something a bit dodgy going on here. Um, but um, th this is just the maths anyway, and uh, gives some, pretty, pr more, some more pretty weird results here. Uh, so if we, uh, if we briefly think about the, the energies, so for the positive mass harmonic oscillator, these are uh, the energies, the n plus a half times h bar times the classical frequency. Um, if this were the same energy equation for the for the negative mass wave functions, then we would have a, a real problem, right? Because we've got we would end up with a negative number underneath the square root. We would then end up with imaginary energies, and that would not be ideal. Um, maybe the sequel to a talk about negative masses is a talk about complex energies. I don't know, but uh, that's maybe for somebody else to think about. Um, but if you do go through and check all of the ladder operators and do all of the uh, fancy things, then it turns out that the, um, that the energies for the negative mass wave functions actually look like this. And luckily, there's an I here to cancel out um, the negative that we would get under the square root here. So we get real energies. So that's nice. So it's been interesting looking at this as a kind of theoretical exercise. But does any of this actually have any bearing on reality? Does any of this provide any useful things at all that we can use to understand our universe? And um, as physicists, it's obviously all very well and good thinking about what might happen. But ultimately, we're trying to understand reality here. And if none of this makes sense in reality, then we're sort of wasting our time. And we should tell the mathematicians about it. Um, but uh, this, this image here, by the way, I'm sure you'll all have seen those images illustrating general relativity by having like a big cannonball in a rubber sheet and space time sort of bends around it in sort of, sort of crude way. This is what it might look like if you have some negative masses and space time actually um, curving over it. So that's, uh, that's just an interesting uh, image. Uh, there have actually been some uh, experiments which have uh, generated some things which behave like they have negative mass. They've, they've shown some negative mass dynamics. So this is one that was um, uh, from Washington a few years ago. And uh, the setup they've got here is uh, they have some rubidium atoms, and they've got them in a bowl. Right, That's what the, uh, the first image here is at zero milliseconds. They've got lots of very, very cold Bose-Einstein condensate uh, rubidium atoms, and they've got them in a bowl. What well, they then did, smash the bowl. And uh, so what you're seeing in uh, the 10 millisecond image is uh, the rubidium atoms spreading out as the bowl is, is, uh, is smashed. And uh, they're obviously doing that because there is a pressure from the inside, just like in a, in a fluid, pushing the outer ones uh, outwards. And that's no longer matched by a force from the bowl. And so they're, they're spreading out, just like what we would you know, expect everything to do. But at 14 milliseconds, some of them are turning back. There's still the same sort of pressures pushing them away from the middle, but they're now responding to that outward pressure by accelerating inwards. So this is um, negative mass hydrodynamics, as they call it. And um, when this was uh, published, or you might even remember a few years ago, there was um, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of press about it. All sorts of newspapers and websites that physicists discover a new exotic form of matter that changes the entire universe. So there are these aren't actual negative masses, right? The third word of their abstract is 
effective mass. These atoms, these rubidium atoms don't have a negative mass. They're rubidium atoms. You can look how much they weigh on a periodic table. They have uh, what's known as a negative effective mass. And this is um, a concept that uh, in various sort of solid state physics and things that just uh, arises. And it's sort of a behavioral mass rather than you know an actual honest to goodness uh, mass that they actually have here. Um, another interesting setup, this was um, a year later. This is the, um, uh, an artist's impression of the, of the setup. So what they've got is they've got two black uh, reflective plates here. Uh, they're called uh, distributed Bragg reflectors. Um, and uh, they basically, it, within them, uh, what's, known, what's known as uh, an optical uh, micro cavity and uh, essentially restricts the different uh, wavelengths of light that could exist in between here. And uh, what they then did was they inserted this, uh, this chicken wiry thing you can see here. This is a um, molybdenum diselenide semiconductor here that they put in this little sandwich thing. And um, some of you might be aware of this, but in, uh, in semiconductors, you often get these things called excitons, which are uh, bound states of electrons and holes kind of, you know, messing around. And uh, what they found in this setup was that those, those excitons interact with the light in the cavity to produce other things called polaritons. And these polaritons, they record to have a negative mass. You can see this on, on the on the y axis here. You've got uh, the masses in ten thousandths of electron mass, and um, it is all below zero. I don't I don't really understand what the the x axis is, but it's uh, I know what the temperatures mean, and uh, this is all below below zero. So that's so that's quite quite interesting. However, again, this is not actually a real thing with negative mass, even the polariton itself isn't actually a thing. It's called a, a quasi-particle. It's just a kind of convenient uh, representation of what's going on, but it certainly doesn't represent you know, a real thing with actual negative mass. So could actual, honest to goodness, negative mass exist? Could, there fi could somebody find one day a particle which has a negative mass to it. Could one even possibly exist? And what if it did? So this is um, for, the, for the kind of last section of my talk, I want to talk about um, this paper that came out uh, a few years ago. Now. This is by somebody called uh, Jamie Farns at uh, some university nobody's really heard of. But um, he's essentially come up with this way to explain both dark energy and dark matter as two different behaviors of the same thing the same he's called it a dark fluid and this dark fluid as thematically you might have guessed has a negative density it's got a negative mass and um so the way that he um he did this was he he did some uh theoretical things which i don't i don't know that much about general relativity so i didn't fully get but um the main thing was that he did lots and lots of uh n body simulations uh for this so he essentially put twenty five thousand uh positive masses into his computer twenty five thousand negative masses told his computer what gravity was and hit play and uh, all of his code by the way is uh, is available online it's on github somewhere so um you know, feel free to have a look and have a play. Um, and it does seem like quite a far-fetched thing to be able to explain, you know, two of the biggest problems in theoretical physics to this day. But it does do a pretty good job of explaining certain things. So uh, some of you may have seen um, this graph before. This is uh, a galaxy rotation curve. So on the y-axis, you've got the uh, orbital speed of stars uh, around their galaxy. Uh, and that is against the, um, the distance they are from the galactic center. Now, Kepler uh, would have predicted 
that you get this sort of sharp rise and, uh, and slow fall thing going on there. But that is not what's actually happening in the universe today. When we look at galaxies, we see this green curve where the sharp rise and then it, it just sort of stays the same regardless of how far out you are. And um, this, this really confused people when they first saw it. So they thought, um, well, there must just be more mass than we think there is in the galaxy, but we must be unable to see it. And uh, thus the concept of dark matter was born. And now physicists are made fun of quite a lot because we don't know where most of the universe is. However, um, some of uh, Farnes's simulations in his paper were taking place at a, a sort of galactic scale. So he simulated some, some galaxies and um, he was able to generate some, uh, some rotation curves out of them. And uh, when he uh, included the negative masses into his kind of galaxy, uh, something that happened quite strikingly was that the negative masses kind of accumulated into a sort of halo around the galaxy. And that's interesting because it's sort of the shape that people think the dark matter will take uh, around, ar around a galaxy. They think, they think that dark matter will be in a kind of halo shape, or, or so I hear. Um, but what's more striking than that is the actual galaxy rotation curves that he was able to generate, because they look like this. So when he just had a galaxy of positive masses, you get pretty much what you know current physics would have you have you believe you've just got a sharp rise and, and a slow fall but when you include some negative masses into the mix you get a sharp rise and it kind of just carries on a little bit this is you know pretty pretty good this is pretty very very close i mean there's some there's obviously some um, there's a little dip at the start and there's some slightly erratic behavior going on but this is really quite quite compelling um there's a uh, another thing as well some some people think that um well and often uh, a way people often sort of dispute the idea of negative masses is um they say well if there's this constant gravitational repulsive force everywhere how on earth would you know all these large structures form how would galaxy clusters form and these big filaments and the slow and great wall if you've got this repulsion everywhere how on earth would all of that happen. But, and uh, this is um, a, a larger scale simulation that Farns did, so you've got uh, positives in, uh, in yellow, negatives in purple, the same color coding as me. Um, but as you can see that when we play this, there's some, I don't know how well you can see this, but um, you can see that there's definitely some structure forming here. You've got some sort of, you've got some like clusters here, you've got some filament things going on. In other words, you've got exactly what we see in the universe today. So it does seem that the presence of negative mass in the universe doesn't actually seem to preclude uh, the formation of these large scale structures that we, that we know and love. There are, uh, unfortunately, issues with uh, this theory as with you know, a theory. Um, one particularly pertinent one is that in some senses, the theory predicts that you would just have negative mass just popping into the universe pretty much everywhere at a fairly uniform, constant rate. And uh, that is something you will be surprised to hear there is no evidence for as yet. But um, Farns himself has actually recently taken up a job uh, working on the on the square kilometer array, um, big radio telescope thingy. Um, I'm not sure how that's been impacted by COVID, but I would imagine poorly. Um, but anyway, he's hoping to find that there might be some radio signal produced by these negative masses popping into existence. So that might be, you know, that might be something to look out for. Cool. As a um, and uh, as a kind of epilogue for this, um, I just want to um, talk about uh, something that a kind of more sort of a philosophical point that um, Farns talked about in his paper. So some of the things that he did in his in the theoretical portion was he sort of divided the universe into its positive mass components and its negative mass components. 
And um, he thought, well, what if there's more positive mass overall than there is negative mass? So what if the universe has an overall positive mass? What would that universe look like? Equally, he also looked at what would it look like if there was more negative mass than positive mass? So if the universe overall uh, had a negative mass, what would that look like? But I think the, uh, the most interesting case is if the two are in fact equal. As uh, for instance, with charge, we, we think that the universe is electrically neutral. So um, what if it is um, massly neutral, gra gravitationally neutral, maybe? Um, and it comes with, with a bit of an interesting point. So if there is no net mass in the universe, then according to a guy called Einstein, there's no net energy in the universe either. And if there's no net energy in the universe, then that means that when the Big Bang happened, that was actually an energy conserving event. When the Big Bang Theory was like, um, not the TV show, when the Big Bang Theory was not a particularly popular one, people said, well, how can you create everything? Surely that's a violation of conservation of energy. Uh, but if there's actually no mass and no energy in the universe, then that's not an issue. The Big Bang conserved energy. And um, another thing, by the way, that Farns talks about in this section of the paper is quantum vacuum fluctuations. So just as a, as a brief aside, you uh, can't have a proper vacuum ever. There's always going to be particle antiparticle pairs popping into existence, borrowing some energy from the universe and giving it back again very, very quickly. And um, I just want to read, read a bit from uh, finds his paper about this. So uh, this process can be described by uh, a relation of the uncertainty principle, uh, which looks like this. Delta E is the amount of energy that you borrowed, and delta T is the, uh, uh, the period of time after which you have to give back, that back. So this, this can be described by the uncertainty principle, um, which leads to uh, the natural consequence that our universe could simply be a vacuum fluctuation that has zero energy and can therefore exist eternally. This implies, he says, that our universe is just one of those things that happen on occasion. And we can simply think of its existence as being illustrated by a one billion sigma statistical event. And if that doesn't make you feel lucky to be alive, I don't know what will. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it was an excellent talk. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please post them in the chat right now or, uh, uh, or speak them out loud. Well, yeah, free. I can see some later if you want. I thought you, I think you cut out, uh, or maybe that was just for me. But you said to catch you later. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so uh, Rory uh, um, is asking, how does minimizing action work for a negative mass particle in free space? Say. Very good question. I did have a brief look at this ages ago, and um, I didn't find a huge amount, but um, I believe what you end up with is that you end up actually maximizing the action instead. Pretty weird, but um, you do kind of, it, I mean, I, I, I hear it's more about sort of extremizing the action, so it's fine. But um, obviously for most things, it is obviously minimizing the action, but um, yeah, I think you end up maximizing it with a negative mass. Pretty weird. Okay. Um, then uh, I have a question as well. Because to me, it seems like there are really two different concepts at play here when you're talking about negative mass. There's the um, dispersion, so to speak, the, uh, the inertial mass, and there's the gravitational aspect of it. Um, and for the, the quasi-particles, you were talking a lot about the reacting to forces. So you're talking about the dispersion and the inertial uh, aspect of mass. Um, but do, doesn't negative mass particle occur quite often in, in this sort of way like holes when we look at are really just the absence of electrons they are negative mass particles that we can equivalently describe with with positive mass and then positive electric charge because the only uh, forces act on them is uh, is electric 
Uh, well, in terms of the um, uh, inertial and gravitational thing, um, a lot of the um, literature on this, there isn't much literature on this, but um, that bit that bit in particular, they do seem to um, suggest that if you, um, uh, in, in all of this that I've been doing, I've put inertial mass and gravitational mass are the same. And um, the sort of reason you do that is if, if you don't, then uh, Einstein's equivalence principle and uh, this is me talking about general relativity, so feel free to correct me. But if you uh, have uh, the inertial mass and gravitational mass different, then the equivalence principle doesn't hold, and then all sorts of hell breaks loose. So, um, yeah, as for the um, uh, stuff about uh, like quasi particles and things like that, um, not only am I a first year, I'm a first year who didn't take materials. So um, I'm, very, <laughs> okay. I'm very much not, not the person to ask that. But, uh, I, I, I mean, I'm sure there's some interesting stuff out there about that. But uh, okay. I, I'd be happy to refer to the couple of papers that uh, I referenced. But yeah, I'm okay. afraid. Thank you very much. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, please put them in the chat now. Otherwise, I'll continue on with, with a few more, uh, I think. Um, so let me see. Um, could you um, go back on the slides? Oh, yes. Actually. Yes. Uh, which one? Sorry. Um, yeah, the one about conserving energy. Because I, I was under the impression that actually general relativity doesn't even have a concept of energy uh, for, for the very end. Um, so the concept of energy conservation, energy or even being defined globally, is, uh, is, is not the case in general relativity. So it doesn't, well, so to speak, it's consistent with general relativity that energy uh, is not conserved. Um, that may be, but um, in, in this case, energy is conserved. So it, it, there might be some cases when, in which, you know, energy isn't conserved and and that would, you know, require more thinking about. But in this case, energy isn't conserved, and so, you know, it's... Um, yeah, no, no, I was thinking about the very, very end, where you're talking about like, positive and negative mass. And also, uh, one other aspect of that I thought was quite interesting um, is we, we again have a... Uh, we have a um, another distinction between different kinds of masses. Um, because we have here, you say, negative mass implies negative... Then uh, negative energy. Yeah. Whereas previously, usually where where energy appears in say special relativity, you always have the mass squared, and then we knowing that the mass is positive can take the square root. Um, so like the the relation we have there is not e equals m c squared. It's e squared is equal to m squared plus momentum squared. I mean, yeah. In fact, um. Yes. But but is is it generally viewed that uh, if you have negative mass, you also have negative energies uh, or uh, negative energy density? It does it does seem to be. It certainly was in um, in this guy's paper. But um, I do see your point, and that's something that I certainly didn't think about myself. So in this okay, uh, we, we have okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll have a look at that. Um, I have another question about the action. If action is generally extremized, can you give an example in classical physics where it's maximized? Um, Question mark. I uh, I cannot. Uh, I um I believe it's general. I think the general extremization is was only really brought into play when Feynman started doing some complicated things with quantum physics, and then he realized, oh, it can be it can be maximized as well. But um, I don't I don't think I don't think anyone can give a case where it's where it's maximized. I, I think I think the answer is that uh, you can generally you can generally always find an action that's oh well that's greater than the true path. So you can't maximize it for positive mass, but you can make it not be a minimum. There are certain situations which I can't recall off the top of my head where you can have a stationary action action that's not a minimum, uh, but still corresponds to the real physical situation. I, I, believe, I believe that would be a local minimum rather than a. A global minimum. No, right. no, wait, it's a saddle point. Oh, I see. Okay, right. Okay. Um, 
Uh, we have frantic typing, I think. Uh, <laughs> um, so he's asking, wouldn't that exclude negative mass? Wouldn't what exclude negative? Oh, I see. Um, um, so if um, so, if you have uh, a negative mass, well, I mean, clearly none of this behaviour makes any kind of intuitive sense. So um, maybe you. Well, uh, classically, perhaps, yeah, maybe, um, maybe that's true. Um, but um, again, I mean, no, nobody's. I mean, the classical thing of uh, minimizing the action is clearly just like an observational thing. Nobody's, you know, nobody had seen any um, any maximal actions until they looked very, very closely at quantum physics. Um, so perhaps you would be able to get a um, uh, a maxim a maximized action if you had some some negative masses in class even classically maybe that would work i don't i don't know i would have to look a bit more into that um on this point i think actually um usually usually you kind of uh from from an axiomatic point of view from trying to deduce uh, classical physics um you'd often start with the principle of minimum action or that the maximum can't be max, uh, action can't be maximized. And then from that, derive that mass is positive. And for example, they, I know they do that in Landau, uh, mechanics. It's one of the, one of the first derivations. Um, but so to speak, you could, you could think that actually the principle of minimum action is an axiom. It needs to come from somewhere. Yeah. So I think, well, I mean, that's presumably come from, you know, observation and experiment. If you, um, we had some negative mass and we saw it maximizing the action then then uh then maybe if maybe using that as an act maybe that would do something different i don't know i'm a first year i don't know about action that is that is very fair uh okay. um okay um we have another question um i always appear to end up with a negative mass from camp Calculating my lab yield. Do you have any ideas how a negative mass could be stored? Um, uh, I'm glad you didn't ask about the lab yield because, frankly, I would not be able to help with that. But um, in terms of storage, you would have to put it. You would have to surround it with something that normal mass would be very happy in. So, like maybe surround it in a vacuum and have like I don't know a block of lead suspended in a vacuum, where and the negative mass would just kind of stay in there. I have no idea how you'd get it out. Maybe you'd like disintegrate the block of block of lead or something, and maybe that would do it. But um, that's probably the best you could hope for. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Do we have any other questions? Uh, otherwise, I think um, I shall declare this talk closed. Um, I can't see anybody typing, uh, so I'll take that as a as a yes and pause the record or end the recording.